a confession to make. Sometimes when my kids are at the playground and I'm sitting on the bench on the side, I check my cell phone. And then I look up and they're yelling, daddy, daddy, look at me, look at me. And I'm like, oh my God, like, why am I like, why am I looking at myself? Why am I not in the moment with them? Why am I not being intentional with them? Sometimes I raise my voice when my three-year-old is not putting his shoes on to go to school. Sometimes I make mistakes. I make mistakes. I'm not a perfect dad. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a better father. I want to be a, a, an intentional, a connected, a patient, and a loving dad. And for me, as I think about constantly improving how I am as a parent, I feel like the world of parenting books, which we haven't talked about much on three books, but I feel like that whole world of parenting books is overwhelming. It's suffocating. There's so many books out there. It's hard to parse through them. They seem to have contradictory messages. I'm sure one says to sleep with your kid. Another one says always leave them in your, in your crib. So people, there's all kinds of controversial views about breastfeeding. It's, it's just, it's too much. But then I noticed that my wife, Leslie, who reads a stack of parenting books, she has a ton of them. She had a book on her bedside table for a really long time. And her connection with that book started deepening and deepening and deepening. And the book laid beside her bed for over a year. That book was called Peaceful Parents, Happy Kids by Dr. Laura Markham. I pick up the book, I start flipping through it, and regardless of what you think about being a parent, it was a warm, empathetic, connected approach to healing your inner traumas first. Dr. Laura Markham argues that we all have inner traumas, even if they are generational, even if they are biological, even if they've come down from gener- you know, parents and grandparents and grandparents before us. We have to heal those inner traumas first, recognize the space between stimulus and response, and then we can live in a peaceful present with our children. It's AHA Parenting, which by the way is the name of her blog, ahaparenting.com. And so I start looking at Dr. Laura Markham. Turns out she's amazing. She is a clinical psychologist from Columbia University. She's also a mom, and she understands kids and parents. What she does is translate proven science into practical and simple and almost listicle type of solutions that you need for an, to live an intentional family life. She is the founding editor at ahaparenting.com, and she also serves as the parenting expert for many uh, websites and like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Real Simple, Newsday, Men's Health, Red Book, Parents Magazines. Over 150,000 people subscribe to her incredible email list, including Leslie and I, and we often forward them to each other. Dr. Laura Markham is the author of three books. They are Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, which is the one I was talking about, How to Stop Yelling and Start Connecting, Peaceful Parent, Happy Siblings, which, we ha- which I have not read yet, How to Stop the Fighting and Raise Friends for Life, Sounds like I need to. And finally, the Peaceful Parent Happy Kids workbook. So I reached out to Dr. Laura Markham, and she was kind enough to grace us with her three most formative books. I flew down to New York City. I took an Uber over to Park Slope, Brooklyn. She welcomed me into her lovely over 100-year-old brownstone into her home. And we had a chat on the, at the back of her house, because they were cutting on a tree at the front of their house, it was really loud, on a couple leather couches, and chatted about Dr. Laura Markham's three most formative books, as well as themes like, how do we rewire our brains to live a happier life? Where are we today in our understanding of mental health challenges? Where are we? We're on the front line, so what do we do? How do we help people around us? How can parents work to reduce stress in their children's lives? How do we be more present with our families? How do we actually begin to heal our own inner traumas? What does attachment really mean? How do we parent sensitive children? And much, much more. If you are a parent, if you are someone who wants to be a parent, I think you will love Chapter 46 with Dr. Laura Markham. So, shall we? Let's get into it now. Hi, Laura. Hi, Neil. Oh, this is a treat. I, I, I just feel so... I, I've been in your home now for five minutes and I feel so comfortable. This is what you do to people. You make them feel comfortable. I'm sitting on a, a brown leather couch with a couple red cushions behind me. Behind me is your beautiful 
like forested backyard. Is that the right word? I hope. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Trees. And, lots of trees. And you moved me. You moved us to the back of this uh, of your of your brownstone here in Park Slope, Brooklyn, because. What's happening at the front? There's like a giant crane out the front window or something. Is somebody cutting down a tree? The, my neighbor's tree is being taken down by the city because it was dead. And so there's quite a great deal of noise. I'm sorry. It's not usually, no. it's usually so serene here. No, no. And I, and as I said to you, back, we love background noise in three books. Everybody, people that might be listening to this right now, you know, if you're driving, I'm in the left ear, I'm in the left channel, you're in the right. People are in the middle of the conversation. I like that there's an empty seat beside you on your I won't say brown, but tan leather couch, because that's the person that's listening to us chat. Oh, yes. They're here with us. Right. How that, wonderful. That's kind of how I picture it. And um, I, uh, it was funny, though, when the Uber driver dro- dropped me here, because he was like, that's as far as I can go. Because they actually, you probably know this, but to cut down the tree, they've closed your whole street. Yeah. yeah. They can't have they can't have cars driving down while yeah. they're in the middle of this. It's a pretty narrow street. This and neighborhood lo- is from the late 1800s. I loved your passion for three books when I got here because you were like, how long is this going to take? And, and the people, the guy was just like, he gave you like the least caring shrug in the world. Yes. He yes. could not care less how long you wondered how long it would be. So, Laura, there's so many ways I could start this conversation, but I thought the best way would be actually play for you a little message from... Uh, my wife. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to play this for you now. Um, here we go. Hi, Dr. Laura. This is Leslie. I just wanted to send you a voice note so that I could send my greatest appreciation to you. I really wish that I could be there in New York having a conversation with you and Neil about your books and to learn more about you. But I just wanted to send a note to say a huge, huge, huge thank you because your book is definitely one of my three books, one of my most formative books. Um, And I just can't even express really in words how much it has enforced the person that I am. I was going to say changed who I am as a parent, but I don't feel like it's that. I feel like it resonated so deeply with me in a feeling in my bones that I have about how to be the mom I want to be, that it has just ignited this spark inside of me and made me feel like I can be that mom that I've always dreamed of being. Um, I feel as though, you know, nobody can really understand what motherhood is going to be like until you're in it. And, you know, you never know what children you're going to be blessed with. And as I've gone down the journey of motherhood and faced challenges, it has been your book that has made me feel as though I can do it. And I can do it in a way that it will be the greatest work that I will ever do. And I just want to say thank you. I am so grateful for your book, Peaceful Parent, Happy Child, and for all of the newsletters that I open and read, every single one. I'm so grateful for your blog, I'm so grateful for the compassion that you offer to to mothers and fathers around the world so that we can all try to do this hard, humbling, courageous, incredible, rewarding work of being a parent. And I'm going to get choked up saying this to you because I just am so, so, so grateful and want to say a huge thank you. Wish it was say- I was saying it to you in person, but hope you and Neil have a great conversation today and looking forward to listening to it. Thanks. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you. How do you handle the love? You get so much love. You get so many messages every single day. I do. I do. Um, I, it keeps me going. You know, it is, it is, um, uh, it stretches my heart. And I think all of us, have more love coming to us than we let in. And so one of the practices that serves us is to let ourselves be touched. Not to say, oh, you don't deserve that, or oh, but I'm not perfect, or all the other things that every parent I speak to on some level says. Like you you, you see your child's adoring eyes. Every parent has probably had the experience when their child is very young and those adoring eyes look at you, and they hold eye contact with you. And some part of you feels like, I- I- I'm not worthy of that. Can I live up to this, right? And I think the practice is 
to let it in, just to let it stretch our hearts and to let let ourselves really feel that love. Um, when I recorded that with Leslie yesterday before in our basement, before I flew out here to New York, um, she was crying. She had tears in her eyes. And you've never met her. And she's never met you. And I'm sitting across from you now, and you're crying. And you have tears in your eyes. And you've never met her. You know? Yeah. Um, that's amazing. I, I get tears in my eyes probably on a daily basis from... Hearing, but when I read a message, not even hear the voice, although it was lovely to hear her voice. She's got a beautiful and, voice. Yeah. And she's very articulate. But I get messages of all kinds from parents uh, who've never met me, who've never, you know, they, they might have just stumbled across my blog mm -hmm. and they write me a, a note. And I get tears on my eyes because it's so, um, the work is so, uh, the work they're doing is so courageous yes, and so uh, deep. Yes. And they're taking, they have the courage and the um, the love for their child is what's motivating them. You know, none of us would do the hard work on ourselves necessarily, just on our own, but our children are so important to us that we're willing to face those demons inside us and do that hard work and stop often generational cycles that are not serving anyone. Yeah, it's. I, I'm so glad you, you and Leslie keep using the phrase hard work, because that partly explains my inner emotions while I was reading Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, which is an incredible book, and I can't wait to be putting. I'm going to put it in my my book club and send that out in my email and just share it with everybody uh, in my world. I loved it. Um, at the same time, when I was reading it, I was I I I'm like I'm beating myself up so much. Do you know? Like, Ouch. Yeah. That's not my intention. No, I know. It's not your intention. But when I read it, I'm like, that's the right way. I'm not doing it the right way. Like, you know, so mm -hmm. many things in here. I'm like, giving your child special time every day. I'm like, I don't do that enough. You know what I mean? I I, I have my self-talk, and this is me. But as I read this, I'm like, uh, I need to do that. Turn off technology with your child. My, my kids say to me, Daddy, why do you love your cell phone so much? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, what I hear when I see this is like, oh my gosh! Like I am really screwing up my kids. Mm. So I think that um, <laughs> you're so that the person who's listening to this, I'm going to speak directly to the person who's listening to this. I bet you resonated with what Neil just said. Like every parent feels guilty about their phone, and how drawn to their phone they are and how it sometimes supersedes their children and how their children think, Daddy, Mommy, why do you love your phone so much? Kids will say it's the most important thing in the parent's life. I know. Right? And we all know that. And I try to put so it in hard. the basement. I turn it off. And I give it to Leslie to hide it from me. I, I and, and that's just one example. It's just one example. I don't but, take it with me to the park, you know, uh, purposely. Oh, so that's huge. Well, that's huge. I'm, that's I'm one learning. huge step. Right. Right? I, I, like, I don't. I never take it with me to the park because I, I see all the other parents standing around looking at their phone. And I'm I, I, it looks ugly until you don't notice you're doing it yourself. <laughs> exactly. 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 It's easy to be judgmental of someone else, and then we realize, yeah. oops. And I think the point is, no one's a perfect parent. That's okay. We don't have to be perfect. Children will come out fine without us being perfect. We do need to be more present. Mm. And I think it's easy to mm, sort of make allowances for ourselves to stretch our lack of presence, right? Yeah. So I think we all need inspiration to bring us back into the present moment to engage with children. Because you said you started from yes. it's hard work. It is hard work. But you know what? We can do hard things. Mm -hmm. And hard, you know anything that's worth doing, if it were easy, we would all be doing it already. Yeah. It, it's hard. And we can support each other to do these hard things that will make such a difference in who our children grow up to be and who we become. Because we're, you know, the, the secret of parenting is we're all parenting ourselves all the time. We're becoming, we are becoming, and our child is the motivation for us to become. Uh, you talk about that so eloquently, especially in the first third of your book about healing your inner traumas first. Yeah. And that, of course, is so hard to manage because, first of all, I was, my parents are incredible. My parents are incredible. I was universally, I was endlessly loved. I was, all I was done was loved as a child. I, they are, love me to this day. They text me whenever I land at any airport and like, you know, to check in. They, they, they follow, they are so 
kind of love me. So then to, to think that I have inner traumas, I was like, what am I? But of course I do. And it's so, it's so, it, your writing is like a warm hug. It's so, it's so kind, so empathetic. It's like you, it's so supportive. And I loved coming to your home because I got, I can look around your house right now and I, I, I see photos of, of a graduation of, of children. Like you have a son and a daughter. They're in their twenties. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, they were raised here in this home. One of them still, your daughter still lives with you, right? I shouldn't say still because my parents keep asking me to move back home still. I'm 40 and married with three kids. And my dad's like, so, you know, you could come back here, right? Like I like, to this day, I'm like, dad, like, that's not really how I do it. But um, so I, I, I get to see you, your parenting philosophy, but also your, you are a loving parent and your kids are, are fun through that. You also told me, it was really interesting for me to hear just before I hit record, that you can trace your family history back really far. So you can see how much of your lineage, like you, you said the 1600s, right? Yeah. And um, I, I also shared with you that like my dad doesn't even know his birthday. Like, you know, so record wise, you can, you can feel your place in this deeper than most people. Yes. And that's, um, that gives me a lot to work with. So I, I shared with you that, um, my great, great, great grandmother, 10 generations back was hanged at the Salem witch trial. She was a Puritan and her, her fault was being basically an uppity woman. She was outspoken about, uh, she would not name names and she would not acquiesce to the trial. These days you get a large email list for that. (laughs) (laughs) But I will also say she probably believed in what the Puritans believed in, right? So she was a courageous woman and stood up against what was going on in her day. So what's a Puritan? Just uh, A Puritan is um, some of the early settlers to New England were, they said, flee, and they were fleeing religious persecution in England, uh, in Europe. And they wanted to set up um, a new land mm-hmm. uh, in God's name. This is the Mayflower, right? Yes, Pilgrims the Mayflower, Rock. the Pilgrims, that's mm-hmm. exactly right. And I had a relative, Rock, you know, an yeah. ancestor on the Mayflower. But they were not the most um, tolerant people. Mm. They believed that it was, the, you know, they had been persecuted themselves and they believed they were right and they persecuted others. So they did not take the lessons that I would have hoped they would have learned they and they, they did perpetrated not heal their inner they, traumas. they did not heal their inner traumas and what's more i would say that my father who was uh, uh may his memory be a blessing uh he um was totally not a puritan and he was not a religious man at all in fact he had pretty much rejected all religion as he, in favor of what he called enlightenment but he was a Puritan at heart. He worked so hard and he taught us to work hard and he did it to make the world a better place. And we all, the children all imbibe that. And I, I believe it's a strength of mine, but I also think, and uh, I've talked a lot with my kids about this, that I unwittingly passed on to them this idea that, you know, um, hard work is our most important job. And so when I say hard work, and you got that from the book, yes. I totally believe that hard work is um, is part of wh- how we do what needs to be done. Yes. But I also think that's not a balanced life. Right. And we also need joy. Yes. And we need love. And sometimes the way you get something done is not by taking action. It's by mm. sitting in stillness mm. and noticing mm-hmm. your higher wisdom yes. and noticing the other person's authentic self that you can connect with and that there's a whole world that is a higher level than hard work. So I would say that I'm still um, engaged in the process of healing the Puritan aspects that have come down through so many generations right. that are still active. Because it's 10 generations ago, I believe you, you yes, told it me, was. But, but you can, so it's three, three or 400 years ago. And, and you're still in the process, like you, you can yes. sense that bigger oneness. And and inside ourselves, we all feel this way. The, the thing that I kept thinking when I was reading Peaceful Parent, Happy Kisses, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so, the reason this resonates so much, I believe your work is because there's so much trauma. There's so much pain. Yes. There's so much yes. heartache. There's so much, lo- like we all have so much going on, so much baggage. And you look outside the window and you look in the news, you look everywhere. It's just, ah, uh, just, so now can you take us, you know, a ima- Take us three or four hundred years in the future now. Oh, Say your work is yes. your work is spreading like wildfire, purposely and well. 
Now, 10 generations down your descendant, you can see one of them. And I don't think you're a grandparent yet. Nope. And I won't, you know, no pressure to the kids if they're listening. But but now take us down the 10 generations. What does the world look like if 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 what you're doing with your work in the world keeps spreading in an incremental way like it is today? Well, first of all. Well, you're pointing at the I'm tree. We, to we the, like the, loud the tree noise. noise. Outside yeah, of they're the they're tree. cutting down a mighty oak. Whatever. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. It had its day. It's a chance yeah. for a new tree to grow. <laughs> so, so I would say that we can change our actions. And as we do that, we influence the brain of the next generation. First of all, we can change our own brains. We can't, the brain is more plastic than we thought, right? We can rewire our own brains. And we know that meditators do that. Yes, right. That yes. we that that, and we also know that the more you feel positive emotions, mm. love, joy, peacefulness, that also changes your brain. It changes the biochemicals circulating in your system. Totally, it changes the number of you know, deepens the, neural pathways towards the, exactly. the positive elements of your brain. Opens mirror neurons towards compassion and empathy. And you're saying these then translate downwards. Yes. So and, so it changes us, but yeah. our children it changes their actual genetics, which genes are flipped on and which genes are flipped off, right? And how do those genes manifest? So we could easily change our biology over the next few generations. We don't have to wait 400 years. Mm. We could wait 100 years and that's mm. what, you know, I don't know whether, I think it would be, would be called four generations, 100 yeah. years. And at that point, we could have a very different reaction when... Uh, let's say there's stress. There's always stress, right? Life, of there are always life lessons to be learned yes. and there are always things that are hard that stress us out. Mm -hmm. Accidents, what's, loss, death. Yes, yes. Divorce, I mean, death, is, death is a part of every life mm -hmm. and so is pain. So what's our reaction as mammals when we encounter pain? Our reaction is to tense up, mm -hmm. right? To resist yes. whatever it is that's unpleasant, even unpleasant. Our, our amygdala releases fight or flight hormone. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. If it's enough of an emergency, absolutely. Yeah. But even small things that we that we just don't like that make us feel that like it's unpleasant, yeah. we, we sort of resist. And I think that we, and we usually lash out if it's a big enough thing. And we assume we're right and the other person is wrong. And we have no problem uh, with lashing out and anger and and basically any pain we can't deal with gets visited on the people we interact with in the world. Every whoa, pain whoa, we whoa, can't whoa. work. Say through. that again. Okay. Any pain. Any that pain we that we can't deal with. That we feel. What will happen to that pain if we don't take responsibility for our reaction? We end up lashing out at someone else. So we're visiting that pain. Why does that happen? On someone else. Why when I get stressed from work? Do I yell at my kids more? This is the same Every thing. parent does. Every mm. parent does. It's Why does the same that happen? Thing. Because we don't, we don't process it internally, so then it has to come out? Well, if you're not conscious, mm. then the unconscious takes over. Oh. Right? If you're conscious of it, you might notice, oh, my goodness, I've had a really stressful day, and I'm my voice well is getting night. louder at my kids. Meal. Right. right, right. So if you bring consciousness mm -hmm. to it, awareness, which I think of as sort of shining a, a light on that, then you, just your simple awareness will begin to melt away some of the stress, and it certainly melts away your reactivity, uh. right? And then you have a choice about how to act, right? That moment between the stimulus, yes. where, which is your child's loud voice or fighting with each other, whatever they're doing at that moment that's setting you off. Yes. And your response. Mm. What can change your response? Awareness, right? And why do we do it? We do it because we're designed for survival, we mammals, but we're not designed for happiness. Whoa. So much of your work plays in that, I want to say, less than a millisecond moment between stimulus yes. and response. It's and everything. In a way, your whole work has just hit a big pause button yes. on this thing that I didn't even really perceive as existing. Yes. Like I'm personally coming to um, more recognize the period between wakefulness and, and, and dreaming these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And I never, you know, I'm 40 now. I never observed that in my life, my first few decades. I'm like, oh, there's a period of time that I never really paid attention to and I can cultivate and grow like a garden right here. And, and similarly, with your help and your work, you're teaching the world, and you're teaching me for sure, um, to put a pause on that. Yeah. See it. Yeah. 
and, and, and that's often, healing. And often in what itself. you say is talk about it too. Yes. So talking is overrated <laughs> in the sense that it can't. It's it's the the mental part of us, mm. right? That doesn't get to the deeper emotions. Mm. So I think feeling it mm. is what transforms it. Being willing to actually sit with the pain and yes. the discomfort and the stress of our day, right? Yeah, exactly. Without having to act it out to someone else. And talking about it is a great way to process Yes. Uh, without having to act it out. But part of what talking does is it allows us to feel it. Now, another thing talking does that's very valuable, actually, is it... Uh, integrates the right and left side of the brain. It integrates the feeling with the more intellectual interpretation. So we have an understanding. And we're, we are humans need to make meaning. We need to understand. Talking is a way to get to meaning. Yes. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a clunky, it's, it's a clunky tool. Uh, this whole podcast, three books is, is talking. Yes. But part of why I do them in person, and I, I share this with you, is so that people who listen can feel the chemistry, can hear the tree being cut down, can feel the beautiful backyard forest, and, and maybe hear the crunch of the leather couch that I, as I touch it. Because now I'm doing stuff in the show that's a little bit broader than talking. Is it as good as a live show? Is it as good as touching someone's hand? Is it as good as seeing someone in person? No, but but it's it's a pathway to get there. Yeah. And that's all we have. We have clunky, cumbersome tools because we're humans and we don't know how to make sense of things like music and sunsets and beauty and love and smell. We can't we we're, we're trying. Maybe in 10 generations we'll have more ways to interact well, beyond did, language and touch and sight. I shouldn't have said when I said talking is overrated. I, I think Oh, I took that and I ran with Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think it is and I think it's a gift. I do think it's a gift. I think that we you, we can look at the sunset and feel it and then talking, as long as we don't take refuge in the words, as long as we use them ah. to connect, to extend, to express, but not as a way to hide. Oh, that's beautiful. And it makes me think that whenever I take a picture of a sunset, inevitably I'm like, well, this doesn't really count. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. So often we try to, but this is why this conversation is about books because they did something to all of us and we are tapping back into that feeling this conversation that we have had so far which has been beautifully flowing like a river and i so appreciate your ability ability to like take me down these these mental pathways is a really really nice segue uh laura into your first book um i am going to guess it is this one am i right dibs okay okay so this book i'll just take 30 seconds to give people a background and i'd love to ask you to tell us about your relationship with it laura your first most formative book is called dibs D-I-B-S, Dibs in Search of Self by Virginia Axline, published by Ballantine Books, or Ballantine Books in 1964. Virginia Axline, who was born in 1911, died in 1988, was a psychologist and one of the pioneers in the use of play therapy. The cover of this book is a picture of a very young boy looking, I don't want to say shy, but his eyes are, are, are kind of looking to the side. He's got big, long bangs and bright freckles. It says the child therapy classic in a big black burst. And the title says the renowned, deeply moving story of an emotionally lost child who found his way back. Yes, Dewey Heads, you can file this in 618.92 under bizarrely a pediatrician. I think it's a misclassification. And the back says this is the story of a little boy named Dibs. He will not talk. He will not play. He has locked himself in a very special prison. And he is alone. This is the story of how he learned to reach out for the sunshine, for life, how he came to the breathless discovery of himself that brought him back to the world of other children. This book shook me so deeply. I can't, I'm going to buy dozens of copies for people. I was so moved by this book. I loved it. Laura, can you tell us about your relationship with Dibs in Search of Self by Virginia Axline, A-X-L-I-N-E? I don't even know how it came into my life. <laughs> I was 14 years old, and all I remember is reading it, like not being able to put it down. Mm. Uh, you know, reading it on the school bus, reading it under my desk at school, like so the teacher couldn't see that I was actually not paying attention. I was reading this book. And that, was that here? Oh, that was in D.C. You, you grew up. I was. I grew mm -hmm. up outside of Washington okay. D.C. Yeah. And no one had ever talked to me about ideas like this. And I didn't know what therapy was. And what I saw happen... What's the decade we're talking? Um, 60s, 70s? Uh, yes. And so, the book came out in 64. So this was uh, around probably... Yeah, I graduated from high school in 1974. So okay. this would have been 1971 maybe. Okay, great. And I was um, 
my sense of what was possible in the world was enlarged. Mm. And my sense of humans was enlarged mm. by seeing simply through presence. Mm -hmm. Virginia Axline was a play therapist and the foundation of play therapy is presence. The child's language is always play. And this is, you know, they don't yet have the words and yeah. they, they wouldn't be able to use them, but they will always demonstrate what's going on inside them by the way they play. And so the healing that needed to happen here was for this child to feel that there was somebody outside himself who cared, mm -hmm. who valued him, who saw who he was. Yeah. And Axline was able to be fully present with him, to see who he was, and to communicate to him in a way that didn't threaten him, that she did see him. And he began to respond. And his little forays into connection through play, she was able to respond to. And it it it's a thriller it's to a, see it's a this thriller. happen. This right? book, is, so this boy is like screams when he gets to class every day. Will not take off in his boots or his coat. The the, the kid, teachers don't know what to do with him for years. He goes and hides under a table all day. Doesn't say a word to anyone in class all day. And the book is nonfiction, told through first person narrative, and it is a thriller. It's a stunning book. What does this do for you? How did this shape or form your life? I think I do my work today partly because I discovered this book when I was 14. Mm -hmm. I think I read this book and I thought, oh, this is a child who would have been written off, mm -hmm. who would have ended up in an institution. Yes. At, because at that time, they, that's they were, what was were, still they happening. They were calling him in the book mentally retarded yes. and he was going to be sent. This yes. was Virginia in, interjected right before he was being sent away for yes. life yes. to a mental... Exactly. And he would know, have been drugged and he would have been institutionalized his whole life. And he's clearly a very bright child who had a shot at life because mm -hmm. of this caring witness. And Ugh. in a way, it's something she she was a gifted psychotherapist, but <laughs> Clearly, obviously, yeah. Yeah. but in a way, it's something anyone can do. Any human yes. without training I can so actually be present. This, yeah, this is a book for parents. Yes, like this it is, is a book for anyone that wants to be a better listener. This is a book for leaders. This is a book for managers. This is a book for, if you interact with people and you want to be better at it. Yes, read this book. Yes, and on page twenty one, there's a there's a a paragraph I underlined that I would like to just quickly read and ask for your reflection. And then remember, this book is 1964, but I, I thought it was written, to, you know, it feels like it's written today. We do not know the answers to the problems interlacing the field of mental health. We know that many of our impressions are fragile. We realize the value of objectivity and calm, ordered study. We know that research is a fascinating combination of hunches, speculation, subjectivity, imagination, hopes, and dreams blended precisely with objectively gathered facts tied down to the reality of a mathematical science. One without the other is incomplete. Together, they inch along the road in search of truth, wherever it may be found. So this was written in 1964. I'm recording this with you in 2020. Where are we, Laura, in today? In We're the, not in the, much different. I mean, in the, wor the world of mental health, yeah. mental illness, where are we as a species? Where do we go from here? It's tying back a little bit to the 10, year, 10 generations in the future question, but like, give me a little portrait for, of today where you think we are and how we navigate from here. We all know people with mental illness. All yes. of us do. Yes. So we're we're learning a lot. The danger with research is you need a lot of research to establish what you might consider a fact, right? One study doesn't tell us anything. You need to build a body of research. We know some things for sure that we didn't know then. For instance, work that's being done by Alan Shore at UCLA on attachment shows us that Every human is born seeking attachment, seeking connection. Do you define attachment? Yes. It is the uh, the adult who is there for you, who protects you, guides you, nurtures you, is responsive to your needs. And secure attachment is not about wearing your baby, breastfeeding your baby, or sleeping with your baby, which are the three big Dr. Sears, you know, attachment yes, yes. parenting We have the big ideas. green book beside our bed. Right. So, so there's nothing book. wrong with those. Like, for instance, there is some research that shows that when you wear a baby, you're more responsive to them, to their needs. So that makes perfect sense, right? But those three things are, are popularizations. What the research shows is that kids need to be securely attached to thrive, in, and when I say thrive, I mean thrive in relation to human beings 
And that also includes their academic performance and their eventual work performance. Manifesting their potential. Yes, exactly. But what does secure attachment mean? It means the child trusts that that adult will respond to their needs, will see them and see their needs and respond. So every person's a little bit different. Do we have a test for this or a way to know? Oh yeah, of course. Like I have three children, I'm thinking in my mind, are they securely attached? How do I know if they are Well, there is actually a test that's used as a laboratory protocol, which you wouldn't do with your children. (laughs) But we we do this test when kids are about 14 months old, where we call it the strange situation. I have one child now that is 14 months old. Well, you won't take your child to the strange situation, which would be a little stressful, but I'll tell you what would happen if you did. Please, please, yeah. Um, You would go into a lab and the laboratory um, white-coated person who is a complete stranger to your child would be totally friendly to you and to the child. So it signals to the child that that person's safe and would sit you down and chat with you for a while and the child would would play with the toys in the playroom. And then the person would ask you to leave the room very briefly. Now, what's going to happen to your child? They're stressed out. Mm. It's a strange situation mm. with a stranger. Yes. They're totally stressed yeah. out. The like when we leave home. the baby with a babysitter. They're going to cry. Yes. They're going to cry. Mm-hmm. But here's what we've learned. It's not what they do when you leave. It's what they do when you come back. Ah, I've read the, this in your book. The securely yes. attached kids, when you come back, they're easily comforted. Right. right. They're like, oh, daddy's back. It's all good. Mm. I'm fine. Oh, daddy, where were you? I was crying. Oh, thank goodness you're here for me. And that's that. It's over and done with. The child who has gotten used to not necessarily having their needs met, where they have to fight to get their needs met, or where you erratically meet their needs, they will come running to you, and often they'll let you pick them up. But then they might hit you and want to be put down, and then they want you to pick to them up again. Appear to be angry with you for, for leaving kind of thing. They're angry at you, and mm-hmm. they, they go back and forth between expressing their pain Because you go versus... back and forth. Exactly. And then the third way, I thought there was a the, third way. These, yes. So originally, when they first started the research, they thought these were the kids who were the best adjusted. The kid often doesn't show upset when you leave the room. They continue to play with the toys, and they barely seem to notice you left. And then when you come back in, they barely seem to notice that you came back. Ooh, they thought that was the best adjusted, but that is the child who is the... The least adjusted. Mm. They're the the kids we call avoidant. They already don't care if you're there or not. Well, they do care because when you hook them up, it turns out when you hook their... When you look at their biology and you hook the electrodes and you monitor their their breathing, their heart rate, it turns out they get very stressed. Well, just like the other kids. They're feeling it, but they just don't trust that you they, are there. They don't trust that if that feeling it will get any positive result. Oh they don't goodness. trust that you will comfort them. How crazy is it? The thing that my mind is thinking like in Canada, where I'm from, and I know you're in the States, like the school system does not begin till age about five. And yet the five years you are with your own child, those are the most important five years to have learning, to know what to do with your child. And you don't have any formal sort of government introduced. I'm not saying the government needs to solve my problems, but I'm like, I got nothing on this. Like, there should this, be training. There's it nothing should. here. Nothing. And Matt leave. Matt leave is tight. Like in Canada, it's a year. We got a year in Canada. And so like, you know. That's because you're an advanced country compared to the policies and of the I United States. I think it States. should be two. Yeah. Of course. Or three. Of course. And what's the U.S.? Yeah. The, the, oh, the U.S., there's no real policy. You're, you're not supposed to lose your job, right? But Ugh. there's no paid leave other than uh, the, the, I mean, your company we might have it, but the society saying, doesn't have we it. We are, as a society, are saying we don't care about right. the next generation's right. connection to your generation, healing trauma, getting the next generation to be strong and, 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 and reach their potential. No, nah, no, yeah. not a big deal. To How can that, how is that not like march in the street worthy? That seems like the first law I would change if I was the president of any country. I would double or triple or quadruple that length of time because of all the stuff you're saying. We we know, the research is very clear about this, that you're right, that that's what we need. But when you think about it, I mean, in the United States at least, all the advances that have been made like a 40-hour work week, you know, or social security for older people, all of those things did take people marching in the street. And Uh there was a stronger labor movement at the time. So, you know, the labor movement you could make lots of criticisms, mm. but as the labor movement is weakened, the kinds of policies that you're talking about have suffered, and we've actually gone backward in the United States, not forward. Fascinating. You said one big thing from 1964 to today was this UCLA research that talks about the value of attachment and how you test it. Are there other, because I the question, the root question about seven minutes well, ago was like mental health. Where are we today? Anything else comes to mind, Laura? Not yes. to put you on the spot. No, but no, just, that's fine. Yeah. Um, we know much, much more about how the brain works. And as I mentioned earlier, we know that the brain can change. So we still don't know enough about 
schizophrenia. Mm. We still don't know enough about if someone has bipolar disorder, right? Yeah. We don't really know. We know how it manifests. We know when it comes to light in the teen years. We know, you know, if people take certain medications, it keeps them on a more even keel. But we don't really know why some people who genetically, it's definitely genetic. We followed that. We, we, so we know a lot of things. Yeah. We don't really understand why some people mm -hmm. who seem genetically predisposed mm -hmm. to developing bipolar disorder yes. don't develop it, or at least don't manifest it in any extreme right. way, whereas right. other people do. And we know it has to do with stress mm -hmm. in childhood, right? right? We're back to stress in childhood. So I'm not saying that every teenager who begins to manifest yeah. bipolar disorder that the parents could have kept their childhood, you know, less stressful. We don't really know, but there are many, there are indications of that. And there's many, there's a lot we could do differently with children to simply keep those kinds of stressors more from, from manifesting so with such drama. Yeah, you also used phrases just there, like schizophrenia and bipolar. And I don't know if other people listening can relate to this, but but I have always felt, or I still feel strongly, that the nomenclature itself is not even there yet because my only sample is my friend Chris, who sadly took his own life after battling with uh, mental illness for a long time. And I was really connected with Chris, and I, I knew his psychiatrist kind of names and the pills he was on and the diagnosis he got over many years and over many different doctors and, and cities. And what he told me was, this doctor calls it major depression. This one says I have borderline personality. This one. See what I'm saying? So for years, my friend Chris, who was like kind of a twice Harvard educated guy with resources to navigate the complex mental health healthcare system, even he with his resources and his desire to be well was like the every health practitioner he talked to was like they were I felt like throwing darts at it. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? And I do. it's not and, their fault. It's I, just because we don't know as a people what's going on. And I, I think we're really in the beginning stages of being able to understand this. And as a society, we 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 deinstitutionalized, right? We did, we invented medications that could control the to symptoms. some degree the symptoms, yeah. but not address. You don't it. look like you got a problem right, anymore, right. so we don't think you got right. one. And we aren't we really have um we don't provide funding for, for mental health the way that we need to. Right. Right. But but I want to just, I want to speak to a specific thing you just said. Yes, you please. mentioned borderline personality disorder. Yes, I did. So when I was in my training, and I was at Columbia University, so this is an Ivy League school. They, you know, and they, uh -huh. what I learned about borderline is that all therapists have a real, are really uncomfortable with borderline patients because they really push our buttons and they're, they're so, such drama queens. And, and this kind of language was actually used informally, right? Mm. And- so here's, you're at Columbia for your I was for my PhD. PhD. Yes. Okay, yeah. So so here's what I think about borderline. I think that people who who um, are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder yes. often start as highly sensitive children mm. who are are oriented toward other people in an an extreme degree. So you know every human's different, right? So I have a son who, you know, I take him out in a stroller and he would. He was always smiling at people, but he's mostly interested in the wheels going around that he would lean over and watch the wheels and how the stroller was put together. My daughter always connected with everybody else, right? So one of those, she was one of those high needs, highly connected people who became, who grew up to be highly socially intelligent, but as a baby was easily overwhelmed. I think she picked up every emotion from everybody in the room. Some people use the phrase HSP. Highly sensitive people. My wife, yeah, mm -hmm. highly sensitive. Yes. My wife, yes. for example, sleeps with a mouth guard and uh -huh. an eye patch yep. to yep. just reduce even sensitivity overnight. Exactly. Wakes up with extremely deep, dark, vivid dreams yes. often. Yes, That type of person is so, what you're talking about. Yeah. So I think someone mm -hmm. who's highly sensitive, mm -hmm. who is very oriented to other people, Yes. Who, do, who has parents who don't quite get it, they don't understand what that child needs and they don't respond with the kind of relationship that child, the deepness. And I'm not saying they're bad parents. I'm just saying they don't see that that's what that child needs and they convention, they parent in a conventional way, basically. Yeah. That kid may well grow up to be the kind of person who thinks to, that to be loved, to get, they think they have to get love. Now, we, you can't make anyone love. You can't get love. Many of us spend our whole lives trying to get love from other people, like we're extracting something, trying to control them. But the truth is, we can only create love and let love in, in our own hearts. We can only basically be, um, if we love, we end up 
pulling for love from the environment, right? But children don't know this. Well, well I don't even know this. Wait, wait. If uh-huh. say, if we love, yes. Or if we if we love, if we can move ourselves selves over and over again to a state of love, mm-hmm. then we end up attracting love mm. from the environment, mm. right? And so children don't know is this. Is this like a proven thing? Hmm. Is, this a do- is it is proven? This a Dr. Try, Laura I, I would, thing, I would say it... let's try this experiment. Okay. I would say let's try the experiment Please. for everyone listening here. That today when you are in a situation with other people, you could be walking down the streets of New York City or on the subway or in your car in a traffic jam. In the basement of a hotel gym in Mongolia. There you go. And you, um, every human you see, go into your heart and connect with that human with love. Just beam love to them. And I'm not saying that you need to actually even make eye contact. They may think you're a little weird, and that's okay. You don't have to do that. Just send them a little love as you go by. In the traffic jam, when somebody cuts you off, just send them some love. Here's what will happen. We Mm. know this. We know from research that you will be happier within three minutes. Right. And that you will feel better for the rest of the day. (laughs) Right. We don't know whether that person feels anything. But as you're happier, you're you, you, we all know common sense will tell us that yeah. then you're pulling for, for warm connection from anyone with whom you do interact. Dang, and this yeah. actually is yeah. a great segue into one of the other books that we have here. Yes, please. Because, Thank you for helping because, me No, transition. no, it's okay. No, we, no, we I, want to, books, I but, want to transition. Which I would, one do you want to go to next? Well, the, I'm, I don't care which one yeah. we talk about first, but I would just say yes. it's a segue yes. to David Hawkins. Okay, great. Because David great. Hawkins would yep. say, we think what's happening is what we can observe on the surface, mm-hmm. but actually we're all radiating all the time. Yes. And we, by radiating, we're affecting what goes on around us, uh-huh. and we're also attracting from the universe. So and David s- Hawkins mm, is okay. the author, uh, David R. Hawkins, H-A-W-K-I-N-S, MD, PhD, is the author of this book that I'm holding here, and you have as well, mm-hmm. Power Versus Force. My book looks like like a yin-yang, like a, like a, mm-hmm. like a, a triangle of, of white, a triangle of black. Yours, yours is blue with a kind of a maroon um, tag across the front. The subtitle is The Hidden Determinants of Human Behavior. Details how anyone may resolve the most crucial of all human dilemmas. How to instantly determine the truth or falsehood of any statement or supposed fact. Dr. Hawkins, who worked as a healing psychiatrist during his long and distinguished career, uses theoretical concepts from particle physics, nonlinear dynamics, and even chaos theory to support his study of human behavior. A fascinating work that will intrigue readers from all walks of life. So as you were just starting to, Laura, I started to interject, but I just wanted to give people the, the contextual element there. By the way, it's 155.23 Individual Psychology. Tell us about your relationship with power versus force and the work of David Hawkins as, a, as, as you were doing a nice segue, and I kind of feel like I clunkily interjected no, there. No, no, so it's all, all good. Yeah. I, think, I think the segue is that we don't understand how powerful we are. All humans are faced with the question of how do I have an impact on the world? Mm. And we somehow, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I sort of thought of power as being a bad thing. Yes. Because so often it's misused and abused. Yes. But actually there's nothing wrong with power. What's wrong is when it's abused, when it turns into force. No one wants to be forced. And one of the basic tenets of coaching children, which is at the core of my work, is that we don't force them whenever possible. There are times every parent has to sometimes. Y- your husband is just yes. kindly tiptoeing. You don't have to tiptoe. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, we uh, we like background noise on this show, <laughs> and um, and and Laura's husband Dan. Dan is just about to grab his bike and and lumber it through our the family room, as you were. And bike bike sounds in the background are all good. Okay, so force. Yes. When we have a child, they're a baby to begin with usually, and we move them around. And we are used to using our physical um, stature, which is much bigger than theirs, to exert our will. And can you imagine being a baby or a toddler? I was in an elevator a couple of days ago with a bunch of adults and one toddler. And the toddler was looking up at everybody, and I thought, this is how everybody begins life. Mm. where they feel pushed around and smaller Mm. than everyone else. And there are some really important lessons that we learn from being smaller, but there are also some things that come out of it where we're on the defensive that are not so good. But 
for parents, one of the things we learned that's not so good is that you can push kids around. Yes. And we do. We take it for granted in our uh, society. Uh, I, I'm in a rush. I just put my kid in his car seat. I yeah. do up the straps, even though he really wants to, but I don't have those yeah. three minutes. So yeah. I just force him to do it. Yeah, exactly. And there are, and every parent relates to this. And there are times you have to pick up the older kid from school. You have to go. You have to get to the mm-hmm. doctor's appointment, whatever it is. And you do, you do you use your superior force. size to force your child. However, However, no human likes to be forced. All humans rebel against force and become resistant. The more you whoa, use- Whoa, whoa, whoa. All humans rebel against force. All humans rebel against feeling pushed Why? around and feeling forced because it Nobody wants infringes to be a on our free will. No one wants to be a follower and everyone what wants- What about the military or, you know- like Well, no, because think about your integrity. Like the reason that strong-willed children are so difficult to manage is that we use conventional parenting and force. And that's an affront to their integrity, Right. And so if they're, if they want to choose, like if we're, if we have a relationship with that strong-willed child that is strong enough that the child is willing to do what we ask, even though they don't think it's that important to get in the car right now and get in the car seat, but they know mom or dad is usually on their side and tries to work with them and they're willing to do it for us. That's the strong-willed kid. Mm. But the the strong-willed kid who feels pushed around all the time feels like that's, an, that's their integrity being compromised and yeah. they're not going to do that. They're not going to let us do that, and they will fight back with everything they have, even to the point of it being bad for them. Right? You can punish them as can much you as you want. Give me an example want. there. I, 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 so, I, I so I'm nodding, and I agree. I just can't. So I just want to bring that ever, to life. There, a bit. Did you ever see the movie Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman? It's a very old movie. He's he's a he gets he get he gets put name. in jail, yeah. and he stands up against the the unfair warden who's who's um you know uh basically unfairly penalizing prisoners, he stands up against him. And in, in the end, he ends up dead, right? It, you know, this is one of those um, cut off your nose to spite your face people who's like not willing to back down because of integrity, even though he knows it'll cost him his life. And I call these kids, the strong will kids, the cool hand Luke kids. Uh. They will not compromise their integrity, right? So you think, well, his will has to be broken, but you I'll can't take break the their will. off in the middle of the car while it's it, moving. Of course. They will do whatever is necessary mm-hmm. to maintain their integrity. So if parents understand that, that no one likes to be pushed around, yeah. then parents can say that you can't necessarily talk sense into a toddler. You can't explain to them why it has to happen this way. They won't have the cerebral power or context necessarily to understand what you're saying. <laughs> right. What you so frustrating. It's totally Don't frustrating. Don't you logically get but you, you need have a seat another, belt? You have yeah. another means. Yeah. You have a relationship. And so with these kids, you have to rely on the relationship and the connection. It's true for all humans that the only way we have influence with another human being is our connection, right? All humans. No human changes their opinion based on a fact. They'll argue with the fact. They'll say it's not a true fact. They'll say it's fake news. But- how, why will they change their opinion? Because of a relationship. They trust you. That would make someone change their this opinion. This is so healing for me because, um, you know, we're late for school. I'm like, guys, brush your teeth. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's. And I'll, I will, I'm so embarrassed to admit this. I'm so embarrassed You're to say not this. alone. Whatever you're going to say, every I'll parent start, listening I'll understands. I'll start clapping really loud. <laughs> like, I'll be like clapping really loud. And then I, I'm so embarrassed to say this. I'll sometimes be like, Come on, brush your teeth. Like, I'll be like that. And my wife, my my Dr. Laura Markham-inspired wife will say, I don't think you guys can brush your teeth. No way. No way. Or she's like, on a different day, she's like, remember that song we love, Bust a Move? You know, by Young MC. She's like, I wonder if we can all do it before the song finishes. And we hit the play on, you know, on the Spotify. And it's like, you know, best friend here. We had to, do, do. and the kids like are laughing. And then she's like, let's play. Whoever can do it first gets the first tickle. Like, I'm like in awe watching her and I'm like, why couldn't I do like I didn't have the energy or wherewithal because I was, you know, grabbing my phone. and I was like, I got this meeting that starts at 845. I got to drop them at 830. Like I'm thinking about the meeting. So she's using power and I'm using force. Exactly right. You're trying to use control. Right. And the amazing thing about children is they follow presence. She's present. Not She's gifts. setting a tone. <laughs> they don't follow gifts. No, no, oh. a, a P R E S E N C E. Oh. Not T S. Yes. Right. Yes. They follow presence. Yes, yes, not gifts. Presence is um, 
it's authenticity. It's being fully in the moment. And sometimes parents will say, yeah, I'm fully in the moment with my anger. But actually, <laughs> your anger is not what's authentic. What's under it is your fear you'll be late to your meeting. That's right. Right? Or your fear that your kid will be an ax murderer because he can't stop hitting his sister. Mm -hmm. It's fear usually that's motivating us when we're angry, right? Because that's a normal response to fight, flight, or freeze is to lash out, right? But if you can show up at a higher level mm -hmm. of connection, heart yes. connection, yes. as opposed to control, kids will always follow you. And so your wife sounds like, Leslie sounds terrifically inventive and creative. She's amazing. And so, but the thing is, we all have access to that creativity and, and inventiveness when we get to a more relaxed level. Like if you can take a breath, I just say stop, drop, and breathe. You know you're gonna, you're worried about being late to your meeting, you're freaked out, you yeah. wanna control your kids. It's not gonna work. And part of what you them. part of what you advocate in your book is like, Neil, you shouldn't have 845 meetings. Well, I absolutely would say that. You should always just, leave you, a buffer so that your kids and if you get to work early, great. But mm -hmm. I tell when parents say they're always late, I say, so first of all, always plan to leave the house 15 minutes earlier than you need to. Worst case scenario, you play at the playground outside their school before they go in. Exactly. You know, you get to work 15 minutes earlier. It's and if that's all good. not working, go to sleep earlier. If that's yes. not working, have dinner earlier. And yes. if that's not working, don't sign up for soccer practice from four to five. Yes. Like you, yes. you take it all the way back yeah. and say systems beat goals, which is something I say yes. all the time. We fall to the level of our systems. We don't rise to the level of our goals. So maybe Neil, it's your fault for kind of going to sleep late because you're up late. Re like own it. Yes. And no, no shame, no blame. Mm -hmm. It's always because that, you know, shame is sort of one of the lowest levels we can come from because it always makes us feel so bad that we deny it and then we act it out unconsciously and foist it on our kids, right? Shame. And think about shame. You're, Do you mean shame? Like you're saying, I shouldn't feel shame for what I've yes, done? Yes, because you will perpetuate that onto your kids. I mean, uh, think about you're in the supermarket. Your uh -huh. kid throws a tantrum. Yes. And what do we all want to do? Some of us don't do this because we're highly evolved maybe, but most of us want to hiss at the kid, stop that right now. You know better. Mm. Now, what if you just, and your kid freezes because everyone's staring and you're, you're threatening under your breath here. What's just happened? You've taken the shame you felt of everyone staring and you've put that onto your child. Right. Now, they're all alone in the world with yes. everyone staring at them without even the help from their beloved parent who usually nurtures and protects them, yes. right? They're the problem. Yes. But you're not the problem. Oh, no. She knows better. I taught her better, right? You're not the problem. You just put it on your child. We And we don't do it consciously. Uh -huh. We just unconsciously- You're teaching them to feel shame in similar situations as they become adults. And that's probably where that came from inside you. You of know what's course. interesting is that I don't do that at all. It's it's weird. It's remarkable. I, I'm like that at home by myself with my kids. I, you know, I clap the hand and I'm like, let's go. At the supermarket, when that happens, I literally sit down- Ignore, uh, ignore everyone around me. Give them a huge hug. Just listen. I will I'll take ten minutes. I don't care where we are. I don't care. I just get. I, so I'm like, shame I'm like a, awesome at the grocery store. Shame is a public thing. Usually, we feel it uh -huh. because we're feeling judged, and that's a very scary thing. If you're judged, judged by the people around you, <laughs> yeah. well, no, it means yeah. that your parents didn't voice that upon you. Right. Whether they had it and healed it, whether they had it and didn't perpetuate it, whether they didn't have Unconditional it. Unconditional love. That it was, could, it, it was nothing a gift. else mattered to them except that I was okay. So I got that from them and I do that for my kids. What an amazing gift. Thank you finally for giving uh, that. Uh, good. I felt I, I, I came out with one high five today. This is a good one, Neil. <laughs> uh, a negative three and plus one there. Um, can we move to your last book? Sure. Okay, this book is is incredible, Power versus Force. But mm -hmm. I don't want to be. I, I don't want to lose Stephen Levine in this. I do not want to lose Stephen Levine because Stephen and Andrea Levine are the authors of your third and final book, which is called Who Dies: An Investigation of Conscious Living and Conscious Dying. Um, the cover is like a like a silhouette of a mountain uh, against like a, a dimming magenta sky. Um, on the back. Uh, this says file under psychology and religion. There's a couple quotes. I want to read one, which is from the preface by Ram Das. Ram Das, of course, gave us a book on the top 1000 already, courtesy of Pete Holmes. Be here now. He is the author of the preface in this book. And it says, because who dies is rooted in our collective intuitive wisdom gleaned from a quiet mind. It is a de definite departure from the plethora of books which the new dying movement has spawned. This book has addressed itself to the many aspects of the dying process with refreshing insight, candor, and lightness. It invites us to look directly at what is with clarity and without judgment. It divests the incredible melodrama called death of its frightful power, supplanting fear with, like you do in your work, Dr. Laura, calm, simple, compassionate understanding. In the book, an investigation, who dies, an investigation of conscious living and conscious dying, 
which, by the way, was published in 1982. Um, you can file this one under death, <laughs> of course. Um, there's even a quote as the book begins that says, and I love this, and I just want to read it to, to, to say, um, today, 200,000 people died. Some died by accident, others by murder, some by overeating, others from starvation, some died still in the womb, others of old age. Um, <clears throat> There are three billion of us on Earth, which, of course, this book is written a while ago, and all three billion must be dead on a schedule within this lifetime. This vast mortality involving something over 50 million of us each year takes place today in relative secrecy. This book is about bringing death out of the shadows and thinking about conscious uh, dying as a conversation we should be having as we're alive. Tell us about your relationship with Who Dies by Stephen and Andrea Levine. Well, I can imagine that you, the listener, who are here in the room with us, listening to us, uh, might be thinking, hmm, uh, Power Versus Force may be interesting. Uh, Dibs, yeah, I've got kids. I'm going to read that book. Who dies? Oh, I don't intend to die anytime soon. Why do I need to read that? I don't know anybody who's sick. I don't know anybody who's dying. I don't need that book. And what I would say is this is that death is the one thing that we absolutely know for sure will happen to every one of us. No one gets out of here alive. And what a powerful phrase. Yeah. And we seem to have a um, an agreement in our culture that we don't talk about it, right? We don't actually acknowledge that any one of us could be hit by a car tomorrow and die, first of all, and every one of us will die at some point. We don't talk about what that means for us. And if we lived in the village where your father was born in India or the village that my great-great-great-grandmother lived in, we would have people dying at home and we would observe people getting old and dying or we would observe people, young people getting sick and dying Maybe what happens to the body afterwards, which we don't ever see. I've never never seen it. I've never seen a body decay in my life. Exactly. We Mm -hmm. don't, we don't, um, we don't see this as a part of life, we, we the life cycle. It, we hide it from ourselves. Yes. yes. In a way, it's similar to the fact that we don't see births. Uh-huh. We don't see children, babies being born at home, right? Well, They're I've born seen in a few. You, you have. Uh, so yeah, you have. Yeah. So, so My last two were, so, uh, Lester gave birth to our last two at home, and I witnessed all three births. So it is it, it discouraged often in the United yeah. States. Yes. Uh, I had midwives for my births, but, mm-hmm. well, my kids are also 24 and 28, so it was long enough ago that that was especially discouraged, but I think it's equally discouraged now, really, to- It's really not do. common. It was a birthing center where I was, yeah. but, you know, the birthing at home, your first baby, nope, you yeah. know. So so at any rate, uh, I would say that death needs to be part of our discussion, not just because it's something that will happen to all of us, but also because when we avoid the subject, our lives are less rich. We need to all acknowledge that there's an ending. Life is finite. Time, we don't have unlimited time. And also when we begin to explore what death is and we begin to confront our fear, I think, again, we're stretching our hearts so that we can feel more while we're here. We can, when we're afraid, when we're carrying fear, all the feelings are in the same place, right? It diminishes the love we can feel. So as we begin to face the things that scare us, and death scares all of us, as we begin to face that, you know, uh, Carlos Castaneda, another book that may or may not be on your list, um, which I read many years ago. Uh, Carlos Castaneda not was a wisdom on the teacher. List, tell us, yeah, tell yeah. Them, yeah. So Carlos Castaneda uh, was a wisdom teacher who wrote about um, his, I think, often psychedelic, but not only psychedelic journeys in Mexico. You know, in the 1960s, uh, with his teacher, and one of the images that he says, and I don't think it was new to him actually, is you want death on your shoulder at all times. Mm. You want death to be your friend mm. and to be your comrade mm-hmm. and your your colleague so that you're not, otherwise death is your enemy. Mm. Death is your haunter, yes. your persecutor, and you're afraid of death and you're, you're only living a partial life. Yes. Um, oh, I, I, I love listening to you. So that's why I'm just like nodding and listening to you. There's a quote from Ram Dass um, in the um, preface that he says, 
to place an individual who is obviously approaching death in a sterile environment that separates the person from family, friends, children, pets, and a familiar environment is a particularly barbaric way of expiating our fear and guilt about death by imagining in the use of the technologies and sterile mechanics over time that we have done all we could. That's interesting. The other thing that he says is science in its zeal for objectivity tells us we are our bodies, the product of Darwinian evolution originating in a chance concatenation of molecular gases, our growth and decay dictated by genetic DNA codes. Thus, thus, death is the end. But there is something in the collective unconscious of the human species that intuitively knows that this objective definition does not embrace the totality of who we are. It's another thing that extends the idea. And uh, I've been with Leslie now six years. We've been married, and, and we were together in a relationship before that. Um, but I also have been in many previous relationships, um, including being married before, um, and have had other partners. And all of them have been somewhat unnerved by the way my father talks about death. Because it's like he he's like, well, you know, when I die in a few years, and he talks openly, like, like he's like, well, I think I'll live to this. And then hey, well, after I die, would you mind doing this for me? Like, it's like, literally, it's like in the middle of a, of a, of a paragraph in the sentence in the middle of dinner. And people, they're always like, what the? Like, it, it's like there. Meanwhile, I also hear people like Tim Ferriss be talking about the, the rise of this new Stoic philosophy. It's not new, obviously, very old Stoic philosophy of memento mori. Have you heard of this? Yeah. So memento mori means surrounding yourself by images of death so that you grow more cu customer familiar to it. So Tim Ferriss, for example, author of 4-Hour Workweek and host of a very popular podcast called the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast, um, he like you know has a skull in his living room, for example, right? Like as a just a, like a, I'm going to be there that one day, mm -hmm. right? I often, at the end of my TED talk, you know, I, I say, you'll never be as young as you are right now. I often use, um, in, in my speeches, I, I use lifespan in days as a way to make it real for people. So I say, you know, how, how long is the average lifespan? And people are like, I don't know, 82. I was like, in days. And, and it was like stunted. And people literally yell out, I'm not kidding, Laura, 10 million, 250,000. They think it's unlimited. They think it's so, people think it's so long. And then I'm like, no, it's actually the average lifespan in the United States, which by the way is 5,000 days higher than the global average, is 30,000 days. And then I say, thank you for spending one of them with me. And this is where half the audience gets up and they're like, well, I got it. I better go, <laughs> go sailing now. What am I doing? Listen to this guy. Um, so there's something about it. But now you've given us the problem statement. So now I guess my, my question to you is like the how. So how do we do this? How do we make put death on our shoulder? How do we make death our friend? How do we embrace conscious living and conscious dying? What do we do? Give me some tools. Well, what I learned from Stephen and Andrea Levine, who've both passed away now, uh, I and I was Stephen, uh, 1937 to 2016. Yeah, and yeah. and his wife Andrea. So I was actually in a workshop with him. So I learned from him personally as well. But this was my first introduction. Was reading How his books. How old were you when you read that? Oh, when I read this. Oh, well, I was 28 years old. I know exactly when I read it because uh, the man I was in love with and intended to marry dropped out of a heart arrhythmia when I was with him. Your fiance. Yes. And uh, that was, you could imagine, one of the most formative uh, experiences of my life. And, and I'm like assuming most no, traumas. Like a heart rhythm means like one day there, one day not. It wasn't uh, like in the oh, hospital for oh, months no, no, or anything. No, 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 no. There was, okay. it was one minute there. Oh one, my God. One minute there driving the car. And then suddenly there was, Were my you? experience was, there's nobody there. His, he just Were said, you there? Oh, yeah. You were with I was him next to car? him in the car, and I was able to get the car off the road. And um, Oh, my God. Yes. And his nine-year-old was in the back seat. Uh, but we got the car off the road. But he never regained consciousness. Uh, his, his, you know, what happens, what happened to him, it was a tachycardia, basically. His heart just speeded up so fast that it stopped being able to pump. Uh, so you could imagine that that kind of an experience would completely change your life. And it would be an experience that you would never choose, but that could give you incredible gifts. And that's what happened to me. And one of the gifts is that I began to look at death. And another gift was that I found thinkers like Stephen Levine, who had spent their lives not just with death as a friend, but also with meditation. Mm. Before that, I had not really uh, been drawn to meditation. I'm a very... Um, you know, I move fast, I talk fast, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I'm in action all the time, yes. I have a great deal of energy. Sitting still was not my forte. <laughs> and what happened is that I began to meditate because of Stephen Levine. So really the effect of this book, when you said my relationship to it, 
I would say is that it changed in concert with the experience of losing the person I was in love with in such a dramatic, sudden way, um, I and encountering death for yeah. the first time. I think what happened is that I realized, well, I began to meditate. I realized there was something more than what we can see, which is a pervasive theme here. And the other thing, when you begin to meditate, you tap into that something. The higher level of consciousness that Ramdas is talking about exactly. in, the, in the preface. Which is mm. about love, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not at the level of the mind, which is full of and certainly chatter and survival words. Mm -hmm. and words. And and there, I'm not sneering at the mind. Uh, I think the mind is an incredible servant for all of us. And I greatly, I, I adore my own mind and the books I've read and the, the words that I have available to me. But there's something that's a higher level, the heart and the wisdom, the deeper wisdom of the higher self, you could call it. Yeah. And people have many words for this, but that's what I found when I meditated, when I began to meditate. So I think that the way, I, I would just say meditation changes your brain. It also changes your life. It, for me, it changed who I am. It changed. Do you meditate daily? I do. How, how what kind, how long? So I would just say, because I speak yes. to parents all the time and they can't do this, that I did not meditate this way okay. when I had little kids, Thank even you. though this happened <laughs> yeah. and I discovered meditation yes. at 28 and I, I you, you hadn't had children at this point. I had not mm -hmm. had children. Mm -hmm. uh, my son was born when I was 34. So yeah. I did go to meditation retreats at that point, like 10 day silent retreats. Yes. And I learned how to meditate, but I did not meditate very much when my kids were little, yeah. but I, I did, I had learned how to shift gears. So if I could be present enough to notice that I was starting to get anxious, like we're going to be late, we have to get in the car, I could stop, drop my agenda and take a breath and shift gears, right? <sighs> that breath, mm. again, the pause button. I had learned how to do that by the time I had children. So even if you can't meditate every day. No wonder you can teach people about it. Yes, you, yes. you found this tiny space between stimulus and response. Exactly. And I now meditate every day, usually for an hour, sometimes less. And I, I hesitate to say that because I don't want people to feel intimidated by that. I can meditate for 15 minutes. And it's, it's sort of Virginia Axline, who wrote mm -hmm. Dibs, yes. um, was the first person to say the number of hugs we get a day. You can get hugs for maintenance, like three hugs for maintenance, but you need 10 hugs for growth. So I would say about meditation... I can do 10 minutes a day for med for, for yes. maintenance, but if I do an hour, that's growth. And I, I feel the difference when I do that. And the difference for me is just that my, I, every one of us has stresses that would bring us our, our equilibrium, our sense of well-being, bring it down a little bit so that we're in a, a less resilient place. But if you want resilience to stand up to the stresses of life and still be able to meet them with mm -hmm. compassion instead yeah. of lashing out, then I think you need to practice and you need to retrain your brain. Uh, um, I could listen to you all day and I have so many more things I want to ask you and talk about. But for now, maybe I'll just stop by saying thank you for giving us your three most formative books told through these stories. Do you have a word of wisdom or a final message that you'd like to share? I guess I would go back to your question about what happens in the future. What are the generational legacies? Where are we headed as humans? And it's easy to become discouraged when we see everything around us that needs healing. And sometimes I do become discouraged when I see that. But I remind myself that actually it's just more apparent now. There have these travesties that need healing, these wounds have been coming, going on a long time. Now they're more transparent. There's a little more, a lot more awareness of them, which is what allows us to heal them. And we, we didn't choose them. We were just born into this moment. I mean, maybe we chose to be born into this moment, but let's assume not. Let's assume we just ended up here it's still in our inbox. It's like you show up for work, there it is in your inbox and you heal it. And I can't prove this, but I believe that the work that ends up in our inbox personally, that as we do that work, we're healing it for our children and for generations to come. And it changes, it 
this is David Hawkins would say this, it also changes the whole world. Mm. Simply by having more of us, you know, the hundredth monkey idea, simply by having more of us reacting with compassion instead of lashing out, assuming that maybe we don't know the whole story, assuming that there's woundedness and that's what's getting acted out here. And of course we're human. Of course we're going to get angry. And we could stop and pause and choose how we respond, right? That movement to love and compassion, I think, is where we're headed. And it it opens up whole new possibilities for the way it is to be human and engage with each other. Oh, movement to love and compassion is where we're headed with a lot of help from you. Dr. Laura Markham, thank you so much for coming on Three Books. Oh, it was such a pleasure to be with you. Hey, everybody. It is just me. It is just Neil again, hanging out in my basement with my backpack full of wires on a stained brown couch, listening to that conversation from her brownstone in Park Slope, Brooklyn, with the amazing Dr. Laura Markham. I love that last phrase. Let's stop and pause and choose how we respond to create a movement towards love and compassion as a people. I partly resonate so deeply with Dr. Laura Markham's work because I feel like the higher place she's leading us towards is also the same place I want three books to lead us towards. Turning off the news, shutting off the newspaper, getting off the internet, the dreaded internet for a while, and just choosing to focus our attention on big, expansive conversations with some of the world's most interesting people using the power of reading as a way to get us there. So, so many quotes jump out for me from Dr. Laura Markham. I will just pick three of them that stuck with me. Maybe they're the same three that stuck with you. She says, all of us have more love coming to us than we let in. That's true. We do. I love you. I do. I want to send you my love right now through this podcast. I want you to feel it. Let it in. And let's do that exercise that Dr. Laura Markham advised us to. I did that after we recorded. You know, you walk down the street, you look at people and you send them some love. I look at people like, you know, people on their cell phone and they, they look up a bit shocked or surprised. I mean, I'm not, I'm not blowing them kisses or anything, but they sort of feel your energy. If you walk by them smiling and just send them some love. Send people some love. I'm sending you some love. Will you let it in? Let's all try to practice letting it in. Another quote, any pain we can't deal with gets projected on someone else. Related to her quote, a sentence later that says, if you're not conscious, then the unconscious takes over. She also says, we are designed for survival, but we are not designed for happiness. I totally agree with that. That's chapter one of my book, The Happiness Equation, talking about how our brains, our amygdala, our fight or flight, our freeze is entirely oriented towards worst case scenario, finding problems, fixing problems. And that's all we do. We look for red lights. We look for bad tests on the on the blood test, blood work we get back from our doctor. We look for the problem we got wrong on our math test. Our brains are awesome at that. What they're less good at, what we have to practice more, is choosing to carve those deep neural pathways towards focusing on life's more positive moments. Because we do live, most of us, in a pretty safe place, in an abundant world, where we get to have time to listen to conversations like this. And if if we are so lucky to be able to do that, and I know that that is a crazy blessing, and we are so lucky to be able to have these conversations, then we should also try to remember that we have to create our own happiness. It's the juice that we get to make in our minds every single day. Thank you so much to the incredible Dr. Laura Markham for giving us three more books on our top 1,000. As a reminder, you can always head over to threebooks.co slash the top 1,000 to view every single book that has been added to our list so far, including now number 866, Dibs in Search of Self by Virginia Axline. Number 865, Power versus Force by David Hawkins, H A W K I N S, Hawkins. And number 864, Who Dies? An Investigation of Conscious Living and Conscious Dying by Stephen Levine and Andrea 
O-N-D-R-E-A, Andrea Levine. I didn't even think we scratched the surface of these books. Maybe with dibs, we went a couple levels deeper. But Power Versus Force and Who Dies, these are gigantic, interesting masterworks. And we sort of skim them. I mean, that's part of the show, right? You, you, you tease out some of the themes from these books so that if you are intrigued, if you are interested, you can chase that bunny. Thank you so much for listening to Chapter 46 of Three Books. And now, if you made it to this far in the podcast, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is the club where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. We play your voicemails. We read your letters. And as we always do, let's start off by going to the phones. Hey, Neil, this is Frank from New Jersey. Um, I thoroughly enjoy your podcast. I'm actually, I've never read a full book in my life, I don't think. Maybe one. Um, but I, ju- I heard about your podcast uh, through an ad in a magazine, like a marketing magazine. Um, and I checked it out and I started at chapter one and I'm in love. It's wonderful. You're doing a great job. Um, I'm calling right now on a full moon. And like I said, I started on chapter one, but I couldn't resist tonight when I saw the moon to uh, check out your new episode. And um, congratulations on your book. Sounds awesome. Looking forward to reading it. Um, And uh, yeah, keep up the good work. Much love and respect to you from New Jersey. Thanks. Thank you so much to Frank from New Jersey for calling one eight three three read a lot and leaving us that heartfelt message. Frank, I love that you said I've never read a book, a full book in my life, maybe one, because so many people are like that and we don't admit that. And I was like that too for years before I kind of got back into reading. It took me a long time to realize that books were more challenging. They took more time. They required more of me, but the rewards were so much greater in terms of what they could do for my emotional growth, for my personal growth, for my connection with my family, with my children. Books are gold. And in this day and age of flying Netflix things, auto-scrolling YouTube videos and pop-up ads every which way, it's nice to take a break. On our show, that's what we're trying to do. Take a break. No ads, no sponsors, no promotions. You got my promise. I'll be doing that for all 14 years. But that's the point. By the way, when you said marketing magazine, in the 14 years was a tip off. I want to talk to you guys about something in just a second. Uh, When you said marketing magazine, I was confused because I've never placed an ad for three books before. Um, So I looked it up. And I think the thing you must have read is an interview with Mel Robbins. Mel Robbins was featured in a marketing magazine. And she was asked, what is your favorite podcast? And she said, three bucks. If you don't know Mel Robbins, check out her work. She will be a future guest on three bucks when I'm able to find time with the daytime talk show host, who is very busy, as you can imagine. Call me on the full moon anytime, everybody. We want to get into the waxing and waning. Looking up to the sky is something we don't do enough. And if this show can help us all do that, including me, that is a gift. Okay. Now, oh yeah, the 14 years thing. So I've been getting people emailing me lately and they've been saying, hey, Neil, you know how you keep saying it's an epic 15-year countdown? Uh, You're dumb. It's not 15 years. It's March 2018 to September 2031. It, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's kind of closer to 14 years. And I said, well, yeah, but when I started the show in 2018, I was like, you know, it, just, it sounded weird to say 14. So I was like, yeah, it's around 15 years. And I thought I might extend it or have a little extra episodes and whatever. But now that I'm almost two years into it and we've kept to our very specific schedule of releasing a show, an episode, a chapter, on the exact minute of every single full moon and new moon, I know for sure it's going to end September 1st, 2031. So I have to do a gigantic mea culpa. And I have to say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said 15. It's 14. Somebody just came up to me at the 92nd Street Y. She's like, look, if you're going to talk to us, librarians, book people, we're going to nail you on this. You have to be the right, you have to be, you have to be the right number of years. And so it's 14 years, not 15 years. And I'm going to start calling it a 14-year countdown. Okay. 14 years, not 15 years. Well, maybe we'll do something after that, but I got to start referring to it as 14 years. Okay, now let's move on to the letter, letters of the chapter. So for letters this time, I want to do something different. Um, I want to, I've been getting lots of letters about my new book, which is called You Are Awesome, 
how to navigate change, wrestle with failure, and live an intentional life. As I read this to you, the book has been out for 10 weeks and has been on the international bestseller list for 10 straight weeks and has made seven different bestseller lists. Huge thank you to all of you guys for supporting the book. But then people always say, oh, what kind of letters do you get? I get the range. The range is huge on the kinds of letters I get. I'm going to read you from the most positive to the most negative. I have taken the letter, the last names off since people are both anonymous. Okay, I'll just leave their, their first name. Dear Neil Pasricha, hi, I hope you're doing good. My name is Kim. I just wanted to send a thank you for the book, You Are Awesome. I really enjoyed it. It has been a really, has really played a big part in my life recently. I'm going through a tough breakup with my child's father. The whole situation is heartbreaking and depressing to the point where I was contemplating ending my life. Then, it just so happened that your book was gifted to me for my birthday. My first thought from my first glance of the cover was, yeah, right, I'm not awesome. But then I was like, well, I may as well give it a read. I've, I've got nothing better to do. I immediately got hooked to it. It is very inspiring and a very humbling book. It has really turned into my Bible. Whenever I'm feeling down, I just read it over and over. It stays at my bedside. This book has taught me so much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Kim. Okay. Another letter to show you the opposite types of letters I get. And I get everything in between, but here's one. Dear Neil, it took me approximately three hours into reading your book entitled You Are Awesome to realize how much of an uncreative degenerate you and your publicist are. I sympathize for the people at P&G who wasted their time and money on a candidate like you. All the people supporting you are even bigger losers. May karma strike your remaining testicle with a cancerous tumor, along with everybody in your bloodline from the profits you reap from this book. Wanker from Vince. And again, I've taken the last name off. Of course, I wrote back to Vince asking him why he thought I was an uncreative degenerate and offering to send him a different book if he wanted to. But so far, he has not replied. If either Vince or Kim are listening to this, Please, as always, anyone whose letter I read, you get a free sign book from me anywhere in the world. Just drop me a line. Tell me it was your letter that I read, and I will mail you one anywhere around the world. Okay, you tell me which book you want to. Book of Awesome, Book of Even More Awesome, You Are Awesome, Happiness Equation, Children's Book, Two Minute Morning's Journal. You pick. I got a bookshelf. We'll sign it and mail it out to you. Okay? And now it is time for the word of the chapter. Okay, let's go back to Dr. Laura Markham for this chapter's word. I shared with you that um, my great-great-great-grandmother, 10 generations back, was hanged at the Salem Witch Trial. She was a Puritan, and her, her fault was being basically an uppity woman. Which word do you think jumped out to me in that clip? I honestly got to tell you guys, I was going to use Puritan. Puritan was the word I was planning to use as the word of the chapter. But then as I listened to that clip again, I was like, something about the word uppity rang a bell. and. I mean, I thought I knew what the word meant. I think I know what the word meant. According to Merriam-Webster, uppity, U-P-P-I-T-Y, means putting on or marked by airs of superiority, also known as arrogant or presumptuous. But then what happened was I fell down a huge rabbit hole, and it turns out that uppity is a word that has a lot more history and meaning than I thought. Therefore, it is a much more interesting word of the chapter. Let me explain. Dictionary.com has a big article called These Common Words Have Nasty Pasts. Common words, yeah, uppity is pretty common. I mean, common enough. What's the nasty past? Well, it seems like uppity was originally recorded in a collection of African-American folk tales known as the Uncle Remus, R-E-M-U-S, Uncle Remus stories from the 1880s. Apparently, the term was used by blacks, but other blacks they thought were too self-assertive. The problem is, Uncle Remus' stories were recorded by a Southern white journalist writing in a black dialect. At least one news source claims uppity was used by racist whites against blacks who didn't know their place. Okay, that's the article on dictionary.com. So I was like, well, is uppity a racist word? I did not know that. And also, is it, if no, if no one knows it's racist, is it? You know what I mean? That's kind of the other question. So I Google, is uppity racist? Top hit, number one on Google, is from The Atlantic. The Atlantic, okay, that just seems like a good source of serious magazine. They've been publishing for over 100 years. The headline is, yep, uppity is racist. A lot of people have no idea that the word uppity, when applied to black people, has racist connotations. 
So this is an article written in 2011. It talks about how the Republican Senator Lynn Westmoreland in 2008 claimed he didn't know uppity had racial connotations when he used the term to des- describe then Senator Barack Obama. I was like, really? I was like, is it is it racist, uppity? I mean, it sounds like it might be. So then I, I go into it a little bit deeper and I find an amazing resource, which is a blog by a woman named Nancy Friedman, who she wrote. Her word of the week was uppity back in September 8th, 2008. And I just want to give a shout out for anyone who's written a blog in 2008, who still has that blog online. You're my hero. I do that. 1000awesomethings.com was started in 2008 and it's still online today. Does it look good? No. Is it kind of ugly? Sure. Is it an old font and all that stuff? Does it look kind of weird? Yeah. And so does so does Nancy Friedman's, nancyfriedman.typepad.com. But it's a great blog. She's done a ton of research. It's interesting. Her word of the week is uppity. Here's what she says, and this is really interesting. Uppity means snobbish, presumptuous, putting on airs. Okay? Also, it means arrogant, taking liberties beyond one's station. It's an American slang formed from up, plus an adjectival ending suggestive of words such as haughty or snooty. Okay, we kind of know that. Um, Interestingly enough, it confirms uppity entered the Southern American vernacular in the 1880s in the Uncle Remus stories written by Joel Chandler Harris. A British equivalent word, uppish, had been popular since about 30 years before that. Less widely used synonyms from back then were biggity, hinkty, and steadily. I love that word, biggity. You're, you're, you're seeming kind of like biggity today, Neil. You put it on airs. Anyway, although any of these terms were and are used by African Americans to disparage one another, Uppity acquired the status of racial epithet, is it epithet or epithet, when used by whites to describe blacks who appeared not to know their place. Okay. Tanahosi Coates, who's famous for writing that book, Between the World and Me, but of course that book was written after this, said, says, this is a quote from him, Uppity is exactly the term white thugs and terrorists used, used to use for high-achieving blacks right before they burned down their neighborhoods and ran them out of town. Only this time, they're going for the whole country. Okay, talking about Obama there. Uh, other interesting point that is brought up here, and this is interesting, I was just like, I didn't know any of this stuff. Uppity also is used when there's no racial context. Like, when did J. Crew get all uppity with an $1,800 jacket? Okay, so I guess the question I want to ask you guys is, if, if no one knows it's racist, is it racist? Obviously... The answer would be no. But if some people know it's racist, some people don't. Is it? I guess it is. But then it depends if you know that. I did not know that. It says, I looked around online. It sounds like 50% of people know that. 50% of people don't. Um, on Urban Dictionary, the definition, which includes the racist term, uh, and it includes the N-word beside it, has the highest number of upvotes of any definition on Urban Dictionary and the highest number of downvotes, meaning half people disagree. How do you know what words we can use anymore? Obviously, if you're using the word uppity now, whether you use it or not, you are a little bit more informed on the word's origin. Okay, that's the point of the word of a chapter, to make us think and question and ponder. If you have an opinion on this, give me a call, one eight three three. 833 well, not word a lot, I'm getting stumbling, one eight three three. 833 read a lot, 1-833-READ-A-L-O-T is my number. Okay, so now it's time to close off chapter 46 with Dr. Laura Markham, a preacher of love. Letting love in, sending love out, and using that as a way to deepen our connection. I do feel a connection with you through your voicemails, through your letters, and just through you there right now, whether or not you ever write a letter or leave a voicemail. I think you feel that connection too. I do, because that's why you're here right now, even though there's time and there's space and there's distance between us. It can't come between us because our minds are connected. Our brains are connected through this, through this right here and right now. So forget today, forget whatever you've got going on and live with me in this eternal present. Anytime you want to hang out, anytime you want to chat, I'll always be here. Thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.